Hello, on the second Sunday of Advent, we are looking at peace. And it is the first Sunday of December, so it is when we celebrate the Lord's Supper. So I do have my bit of cracker here, and I have my water, actually. So if you need to gather your elements, please do so, or because you're watching a recording, you'll be able to pause and be able to do that at your leisure. So just wanted to remind you to do so. A scripture reading for this second Sunday of Advent comes from Romans chapter 15, verses 4 through 13, which reads, For whatever was written in the past was written for our instruction, so that we may have hope through endurance and through the encouragement from the scriptures. Now, may the God who gives endurance and encouragement grant you to live in harmony with one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that you may glorify the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ with one mind and one voice. Therefore, welcome one another, just as Christ also welcomed you to the glory of God. For I say that Christ became a servant of the circumcised on behalf of God's truth to confirm the promises to the fathers, and so that Gentiles may glorify God for his mercy, as it is written. Therefore, I will praise you among the Gentiles, and I will sing praise to your name. Again, it says, Rejoice, you Gentiles, with his people. And again, Praise the Lord, all you Gentiles. Let all the peoples praise him. And again, Isaiah says, The root of Jesse will appear, the one who rises to rule the Gentiles. The Gentiles will hope in him. Now may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you believe so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Peace, my goodness, in our contentious world, it may seem like a fairy tale, especially the type of peace that gives us one voice and one mind, <laughs> as Paul says in the Romans text. It seems I don't know, impossible given the current state of things where our world just seems very fragile. But today is the second Sunday in Advent where we light the candle of peace and we reflect on the peace of Christ and the possibility for peace in our world. And this may leave us with questions about peace. You know, maybe, uh, is it possible? Is, is peace the absence of conflict or is it something entirely different. And I'm sure that there are some parents that may wish for peace between their siblings at times, or teachers that wish for peace in their classrooms, or bosses that wish for peace in their workplaces. Romans 15 lays out instructions on how we ought to live with one another. Those who are strong bear with the failings of the weak, which means we care for our neighbors. And we're to have the same attitude as Christ did towards one another. The foundation of peace, this foundation of learning to live in community with one another, isn't a removal of conflict. It's not having difficult topics or conversations or never having hard words with each other. Instead, the foundation is Christ. Aligning one's attitude with Christ is what brings about one mind and one voice with which we can then glorify God. This season is when we talk about peace on earth often, but if Romans 15 is any indication, then it's true what the songwriters say about peace beginning with us. This isn't about winning an argument or avoiding an argument, but about what it means to build a foundation on Christ that ultimately leads to one mind and one voice with those around us. You know, Paul wrote this because the members of the church in Rome were allowing their disagreements to divide them. And to be honest, this happens much too often in churches. Mm, happens much too often in families, too. So to fully understand this text that Paul wrote in chapter 15, I think it's important for us to explore the contents of Romans 14. Now, I'm not posting any scriptures on this. I'm just going to kind of give you an overview in Romans 14, Paul talks about the eating practices of Christians, about how some who have a strong faith eat meat, while some may have a weaker faith in their only eating vegetables. But you see, during that time, the context here is the meat that was offered to gods in worship would then be served 
and restaurants. So I think this is likely the type of meat that Paul was talking about. And he also brings up the same issue in 1 Corinthians chapter 8. And he doesn't he doesn't say um, an issue with eating meat that's been sacrificed to idols because to him the idols mean absolutely nothing. But he's also careful to say that he will not be a stumbling block to those who disagree with him either. So this debate, it seems to be that some Christians view the meat as no problem and not a hindrance to their faith, whereas others view it as equal to idol worship. Those on either side of the argument were judging each other on what was the correct way to worship God. And Paul, he comes to them and he says, don't judge one another. He implores them to not create a stumbling block for others with their choices. Makes me think, where are our stumbling blocks? Where are we actually presenting or putting up a block? In music styles, Sunday school curriculum, mission ideas, or some other area maybe in our church? I don't know. But we, we can be like the Romans as well. So Paul, he moves into this idea that those who are strong look out for the well-being of those who are weak. The focus isn't on what's best for, well, say me and my relationship with Christ, whether or not I can eat meat, but on what is good for our neighbors. Really, the focus is on what builds up the community. And this is about submission. It's about selflessness. Because to live in community means that we look out for the well-being of others. Living in community at times means putting aside our own desires to build up the community. And this doesn't mean that everyone is going to agree. There were clearly a lot of disagreements back in Paul's time. During the community, or I should say through the community of faith, um, there will be disagreements. But... The foundation should be the same. This idea of one mind and one voice are born out of us wanting to be Christ-like. He is the example of love. He's the example of compassion for caring for one another, for submission, for sacrifice, for selflessness. And as we grow in our discipleship, God gives us the endurance and the encouragement to be made more like Jesus. We, we must remember that we were commissioned to share the good news, that we are commanded to love God and to love each other. And we must do his will so that we can bring others to him here and now. And this, this may mean that we're doing something different, that we're doing something new. Yet the foundation is still the same. This is where the idea of one mind and one voice comes into play. In Ephesians 4, verse 5, it's where Paul is talking about one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The people are united not because they agree on everything, but because they have the same foundation. Accepting one another doesn't happen in a vacuum. We do it because we, we have been accepted by Christ. And as we become more like Christ, we align ourselves with the mind of Christ, or we should. He accepts us where we are, feeble faith and all. So we are to accept one another, feeble faith and all. Paul is really emphasizing Jesus' servanthood, that Jesus became a servant so that God might be glorified. Therefore, we must be servants, and then our lives lived in unity with one another will lead to God being glorified. Really, today's passage is a call to all of us to be more like Jesus. And they're kind of harsh words, harsh words definitely to the church because he's calling them to something greater. He calls out their favoritism and he tells them to learn to evaluate one another. He calls out their judgmentalism and tells them to embrace everyone. He calls out their exclusionary systems and tells them to look upon others the way Christ looks upon them. It is intergenerational. It's what I believe God has been leading us to, being here and now. It would be easy to look at peace in a community as the absence of conflict. 
Paul, however, isn't avoiding conflict or confrontation because he knows that the way to true peace in community is to confront the things that are keeping the community of faith from looking like Jesus. The way to live in community with one another is not to ignore the issues, but to be reminded of who we are called to be like. It is not an exclusionary call. It's a reminder that because you are part of this, this is who we are. We are like Christ. Paul is reminding the faith community of the mercy and the grace Christ showed them that they should be showing one another. Where in our church community do we need to be confronted with our judgmentalism, our favoritism, or exclusionary practices? Where do we need to be reminded of our foundation and identity in Christ? When we have ignored conflict for the sake of a false sense of peace instead of doing the hard work of holiness that asks us to examine our own hearts, we have to say, where do we need to submit? Where do we need to be selfless and surrender to the good of the community? Where do we need to look like the servant that Jesus was? If peace in the community truly begins with me, we have to be saying, each of us, in our me or I voice, where do I need to allow my heart to be transformed that I might be a person of peace? Communities, even communities of faith are full of people with differing opinions. We have deep feelings about important issues. It would be easy for us to think or say that being quiet will bring peace. But Paul, he's laid out a different way for us. He speaks harsh words, but his words are ultimately a call to remember who we are. He didn't ignore the conflict. He waded right into it and said, remember, we are to be Christ-like. So I too say to you all, remember, we are to be Christ-like. We live in days that are seemingly just strewn with extreme division, and it would be a mistake to ignore it. Instead, we need to ask, if peace on earth begins with me, what do I need to change in my life to be a peacemaker? If God has extended grace and mercy to me, to us, where do I or where do we need to extend grace and mercy? This isn't about a list of things we should and shouldn't do. This is a call to look at the person of Jesus and at who we are supposed to be in the world. We are supposed to be his people doing his will above our own. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper, let us examine our hearts and do the work of walking through conflict with those who think differently so that we might find a deep and wide community of faith, a community of peace, a community of Christ with one voice glorifying God. Well, we're going to go to our Lord's Supper, and I wanted to make this one that fit our Advent time. Last week we lit a candle for hope, and this week we're lighting a candle for peace. Some words before our Lord's Supper. In God we have a constant source of hope. Hope as a rainbow for a world in chaos. Hope as bread for wanderers in the desert. Hope as a land restored and renewed. Hope as a baby born long ago. Hope at a table set with symbols. It is at this table we remember the child and the man. A child born in poverty, a man rich with grace. The child a promise of love and salvation, the man a fulfillment of forgiveness and grace. In his last hours, as in his first, Jesus was surrounded by love. He celebrated the meal and shared a wonderful new birth of hope. He said, eat every one of you of this bread, and this is my body, it's broken for you. He said, drink every one of you this cup, for this is my blood that is shed for you. This cup is a new covenant that God, through Christ, is making with us. A covenant of hope, a covenant of peace, a covenant of love, a covenant of joy. Let us go to God now for his supper. 
Your death, O Lord, we commemorate. Your resurrection, we confess. Your final coming, oh, we await. Glory be to you, O Christ. Father of all, we give you thanks, we give you praise that when we were still far off, you met us in your son and brought us home. Dying and living, he declared your love. He gave us grace and opened the gate of glory. May we who share Christ's body live his risen life. May we, who drink this cup, bring life to others. We, whom the Spirit lights, gives light to the world. Keep us firm in the hope that you have set before us, so we and all of your children shall be free, and the whole earth will live to praise your name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.